From Atlanta in late 1864, Sherman proposed to march his army through the heart of Georgia all the way to Savannah. His army would live off the land, destroying everything in its path that could conceivably aid the faltering Confederacy, and a good deal that couldn't. I can make this march, he promised, and make Georgia howl. Lincoln's advisors thought Sherman's plan foolhardy. The president approved it. If you can whip Lee and I can march to the Atlantic, Sherman told Grant, I think Uncle Abe will give us 20 days leave to see the young folks. There are rumors that we are to cut loose and march south to the ocean. We're in fine shape and I think could go anywhere Uncle Billy would lead. Private Theodore Upson. Before leaving Atlanta, Sherman ordered all townspeople, white and black, out of their homes, then directed his men to burn or destroy anything of use to the rebels. Civilians looted the town and helped spread the blaze throughout the city. A grand and awful spectacle is presented to the beholder in this beautiful city, now in flames. The heaven is one expanse of lurid fire, the air is filled with flying cinders. The city, which next to Richmond has furnished more material for prosecuting the war than any other in the South, exists no more as a means for injury to be used by the enemies of the Union. Sherman began his march. 62,000 men in blue were on the move in two great columns. Their supply train stretched 25 miles. A slave watching the army stream past wondered aloud if anybody was left up north. The name of the captain of Atlanta, if he fails now, will become the scoff of mankind and the humiliation of the United States for all time. If he succeeds, it will be written on the tablet of fame. London Herald. Reaching the hill just outside the old rebel works, we paused to look back. Behind us lay Atlanta in ruins, the black smoke rising high in the air, hanging like a pall. Then we turned our horses' heads to the east. Atlanta was soon lost behind the screen of trees and became a thing of the past. It had been cumulative evidence that an army could subsist itself on what was growing in the fields, winter or summer. And uh, they, they were a, a moving city like. They would grind their own corn uh, at the grist mills along the way, uh, butcher their own cattle. The Sherman was perfectly satisfied he could make the march without difficulty with God's supplies. In fact, they ate better on that march than they did not marching. Sweet potatoes were particularly prized and pork. They had plenty to eat. This is probably the most gigantic pleasure excursion ever planned. It already beats everything I ever saw soldiering and promises to prove much richer yet. We had a gay old campaign. Destroyed all we could not eat, stole their niggers, burned their cotton and gin, spilled their sorghum, burned and twisted their railroads and raised hell, generally. Sherman's men tore up railroads, heating the rails and twisting them beyond repair. It became a trademark, Sherman's neckties. He forbade his men to plunder the homes they passed, but neither he nor they took the order very seriously. I've got a regiment that can kill, gut, and scrape a pig without breaking ranks. They say no living thing is found in Sherman's track, only chimneys, like telegraph poles to carry the news of his attack backwards. Mary Chestnut. I doubt if history affords a parallel to the deep and bitter enmity of the women of the South. No one who sees them and hears, but must feel the intensity of their hate. As far as the eye could reach, 
The lurid flames of burning houses lit up the heavens. I could stand out on the veranda and for two or three miles watch the Yankees as they came on. I could mark when they reached the residence of each and every friend on the road. The troops looted slave cabins as well as mansions, poked their ramrods into flower beds in search of buried valuables, and burned everything in their path. The thousand pounds of meat in my smokehouse is gone. My 18 fat turkeys, my hens, chickens, and fowl, my young pigs are shot down in my yard as if they were the rebels. The cruelties practiced on this campaign towards the citizens have been enough to blast a more sacred cause than ours. We hardly deserve success. At Milledgeville, Georgia, Sherman's men boiled their coffee over bonfires of Confederate currency, held a mock session of the legislature that passed a resolution returning Georgia to the Union. Sherman's men were feasting on delicacies foraged from local farms when a band of emaciated men tottered into the firelight. They were Union escapees from Andersonville Prison. An Indiana colonel remembered that the sight of the starved men sickened and infuriated his troops. When foraging now, they think of the tens of thousands of their imprisoned comrades slowly perishing with hunger, and they sweep with the scythe of destruction. Before they were through, Sherman and his men would cross 425 miles of hostile territory and wreak $100 million worth of havoc. The South would never forget. <laughs> 